Hi students, welcome to yet another integrated session. And if you think you've suddenly been bombarded with integrated sessions and integration is something new, then you're sadly mistaken. Integration has been a part of our lives since long. Being doctors, you are going to struggle between work-life integration, between your ambitions and responsibility integration. But don't worry, we are not here to tell you, give you life lessons on how to integrate yes. between your life and work. We are here to bring you a session, integrated session on pathology and OBGY. So hi, I am Dr. Sakshi Arora Hans, your OBS and Gynae faculty. Hi, I'm Dr. Ilajan Kandelwal, your pathology faculty. And today, ma'am and me are here to discuss a very important thing that is an integration between two lovely subjects, a beautiful subjects like OBS and Gynae and a very colorful subject like pathology. Yes, ma'am. And when two females meet, especially when a pathologist and an obstetrician yes. and a gynecology meet, they, it has to be full of colors. Exactly. <laughs> so today we are going to discuss with you that how you're going to treat your patients, your obstetric patients with your knowledge, which you have gained from Ila ma'am, that is your pathology knowledge. But it's very important for you to understand that these kinds of sessions are not only important while you are giving your exam. They are also very important because they help you make a better clinician. Exactly. A good clinician is one who's got a sound preclinical and paraclinical subject knowledge. And if you know both the things, the paraclinical subjects as well as the clinical subjects, then only you will be able to integrate both of them. So the idea behind these sessions is just to make you aware of how to solve MCQs. You know, these days, a lot of those clinical STEM and long questions are asked and they're usually two or three part questions. So there will be something like, uh, what is the... Um, and this is the image or this is the clinical history. What is the most likely diagnosis or management? So to solve such questions, it is very important for all of you to have a concise knowledge, a uh, uh, concept based knowledge, uh, integrating the paraclinical subjects and the clinical subjects. So without wasting any more time, let us start with the first question. The question says that a 55 year old postmenopausal female presents to your office for evaluation of postmenopausal bleeding. She is morbid obese, has chronic hypertension and adult onset diabetes. An endometrial sampling done in the office shows the following image. Which of the following is the next step in management? Now here both ma'am and me are also going to tell you how to pick up the keywords because in long stem questions you have to save your time, you have to pick up the keywords. In this question you have four keywords, the age of the patient, Patient presents with postmenopausal bleeding along with obesity, hypertension and diabetes, right? So these are the keywords. Ma'am is going to further elaborate on them. Ma'am, before I start elaborating on that, uh, I would like to compliment you that still you are maintaining your undergraduate habit of highlighting oh, those yes, uh, keywords. <laughs> and that's very important. But when you are reading the question itself, at that very moment itself, you have exactly. to highlight the important keywords. And as ma'am said, that in this question, the keywords are that this patient is coming to you with postmenopausal bleeding, she has hypertension, diabetes, and she is obese. Now, all of you know that if a female is diabetic, she has hypertension and obese. That is something which is called as the corpus cancer syndrome. And these females are high risk of having endometrial cancer. Right now, uh, whenever a patient comes to you with postmenopausal bleeding, see the first thing which you are going to do, the first investigation which you are going to do in the female is you're going to do a transvaginal ultrasonography because I want to look at the thickness of the endometrium and I also want to detect that if there is any focal lesion which I can pick up. Now, this is one mistake which all of you very commonly do. If a female comes to you with postmenopausal bleeding, definitely an ultrasound is needed before you take up the patient for endometrial biopsy. But this is not the case if a perimenopausal female comes to you with AOB. So in this patient, a TVS would have been done and on if on TVS the endometrial thickness was more than equal to 4 millimeters, then I would have gone for endometrial sampling and so over here very rightly endometrial sampling was done although they haven't mentioned that they had done a TVS but you should 
to know that first a TVS would have been done. And when endometrial sampling was done, then, uh, you know, the report will tell you how and what the patient is suffering from. So, ma'am, what is the report telling yeah. us? So, before I tell you how, uh, what is the diagnosis in this endometrial biopsy, what you should know is how does a normal endometrium look like? Right. Now, what do you see in a normal endometrium? It is composed of endometrial glands, you all know, plus stroma. There is abundant fibromuscular stroma, right? Here, when you see this image, you can see that you have endometrial glands, but there is no stroma here, right? So, what I am seeing is a lot of endometrial glands and minimal stroma. That is what is called as endometrial hyperplasia. What is hyperplasia? It is increased number of cells. Basics in pathology, you all know, hyperplasia is increased number of cells, no increase in the size of cells, right? So, this is endometrial hyperplasia. What is it? Increased proliferation of endometrial glands relative to the stroma. And because of that, what happens? There is an increased gland to stroma ratio. As you see in this image, you can see a large number of endometrial glands, right? And very less stroma. So, there is definitely okay. endometrial hyperplasia. Okay, now, so ma'am, that is very important that less stroma should click uh, you know it should bring to our minds exactly. that it is a case of hyperplasia. it could be a case of yes. hyperplasia absolutely okay. and now as a pathologist it is my responsibility to tell the clinician whether it is typical endometrial hyperplasia or atypical endometrial hyperplasia correct now how do you differentiate between both of them okay so in this image can you people appreciate that we have endometrial glands, right? There is some proliferation of glands. It's not that they are normal. I can also see some stroma, right? So this in this, so in this there is endometrial proliferation plus there is some stroma. The glands are some of them are cystically dilated, right? You all know what is dilatation of gland? I can see here these glands are dilated. So normal gland is like this, but when it changes its shape like this, it is called cystic dilatation or dilatation of glands, right? So that happens in a typical endometrial hyperplasia. Now you will ask me, ma'am, when do we call it as atypical endometrial hyperplasia? So, in pathology students, whenever the term atypical comes, atypia, you know, the basics of neoplasia, when I taught you, atypia means points towards malignancy, right? It means something atypical. That means the uh, slide which you see has atypical cells. What is the definition of atypical cells? Nuclear pleomorphism, that is variation in size and shape of cells. Then there is hyperchromatic nuclei, prominent nuclei, loss of polarity. Now, let us focus on this image students i cannot see any stroma right you cannot see any stroma that means definitely it is endometrial hyperplasia right how do i differentiate it uh, by seeing the glands how do i say that this is atypical you can see the gland morphology uh, can you people appreciate they are much more complex glands much more branching glands right and much more crowded with no fibromuscular stroma the important thing, the nuclear features. So, please see the nuclear features here. It looks much more blue. When I see malignancy, usually blue. Why blue? Because nucleus is blue. Hyperchromatic nuclei, prominent nucleoli. So, here you all can appreciate these blue nuclei, nucleoli uh, and uh, here you all can appreciate these hyperchromatic nuclei and prominent nuclei. Another very important thing which is given in Robin's students is that the axis of these nuclei is not perpendicular to the basement okay. membrane. So, this is the basement membrane. The mm -hmm. cells are not exactly perpendicular right. as occurs in a normal endometrial gland, right? The cells change their shape. Some of them are horizontal. They lose their polarity, right? So, these are some simple features by which we differentiate atypical endometrial hyperplasia from typical. Remember one thing, atypical endometrial hyperplasia is also called as endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma. Why is it given a term carcinoma? Because it is a very important risk factor for endometrial carcinoma, right? And as a pathologist, it is my responsibility to tell the clinician the exact diagnosis because the management of both of them is totally different as ma'am would tell you just now. Right. Ma'am, just one thing over here, like you were saying that these glands are cystically 
artificially dilated. Yeah. Ma'am, is that the reason why uh, typical endometrial hyperplasia is also called as cystic glandular hyperplasia? Yes, yes. Sometimes it is called as because if the cystic element is much more, then we call it as cystic glandular hyperplasia. Right. And ma'am, when you said that it is, uh, whenever we see a blue slide, I mean more of blue color in a slide, would that always mean that it is pointing towards malignancy? No, 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 ma'am. Please, students, then you don't say, Ila ma'am said this because you have a tendency to pick up uh, certain right. uh, wrong things. No, it is not always. But you know, uh, whenever we are thinking in terms of a malignancy and we see a lot of blue because nucleus is blue, basophilic. Right. So if it is hyperchromatic, the slide is very, very basophilic. So that is a clue which we pathologists pick up. But you please skip this line, students, because then you might be in trouble. Mom, but rather, I find it so easy to remember na, a little bit more of blue pointing towards yes. uh, malignancy and a little bit more of pink pointing towards benign. it being uh, benign. Yeah. I don't want to offend uh, the male students who are listening to it. But yes, blue is males are little malignant and females <laughs> a little benign. So yes. pink slides a little towards benign, benign. side and blue slide a little towards yeah, that malignant way, That's side. a very good way, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Uh, so... Over here, now in this slide, ma'am, what are we seeing over here? Okay, so in this slide, you can see there is no stroma and there is nuclear pleomorphism and the cells are not perpendicular. So this right. is atypical endometrial hyperplasia. So the pathologist is going to tell me that it is a case of atypical endometrial hyperplasia. Now to, uh, read the question very carefully. The question is saying that what is the next step in management? Now, whenever you get a biopsy report and the biopsy Biopsy report is telling you that it is endometrial hyperplasia. It depends upon whether the report is telling you atypia is present or atypia is absent. If atypia is absent, the chances of it progressing to endometrial cancer are very less. And that is why management in such cases is medical management. And all of you know that we use progesterone in such females. Best is that you use a Mirena IUCD. But when report comes as atypical endometrial endometrial hyperplasia and as ma'am rightly said that atypical endometrial hyperplasia is a precursor to endometrial cancer and the chances of a atypical endometrial hyperplasia progressing to cancer are very high. In case of simple hyperplasia with atypia the chances are 8% and with complex hyperplasia with atypia the chances are roughly 30%. So definitely the management is surgical management where I have to do a total abdominal hysterectomy. But just one word of caution over here. You are not going to proceed to TAH without confirming that whether endometrial cancer is present there or not. Because the moment mm. you know endometrial cancer is present, it means that now the management is not going to be a TAH. So please read your questions very carefully. If your question says that atypical endometrial hyperplasia is present and they are asking you next step in management then for diagnosing endometrial cancer also the best management the gold standard investigation is that you have to do a hysteroscopy and a fractional curettage so i am going to do because the report has come as atypical endometrial hyperplasia i know i have to do a hysterectomy but the next step will not be hysterectomy next step will be dilatation and curettage or fractional curettage and hysteroscopy so over here in the options, you have OCPs as option A, option B, TAH with BSO, option C as myomectomy and option D, DNC with hysteroscopy. So the next step in management will be DNC with okay. hysteroscopy. Uh, Ma'am, just one thing I wanted to ask you. Ma'am, uh, this... Uh, you know, nomenclature as simple hyperplasia with atypia, simple hyperplasia without atypia, complex. Is it still used? No. Uh, so this is another thing which I wanted to tell you that the latest WHO classification just divides endometrial hyperplasia into typical and atypical. The earlier Robbins and earlier WHO okay. stated it to be simple hyperplasia without atypia with atypia and complex without atypia with atypia. Right. Now, simple we used to tell on gland morphology and the without and with atypia according to the nuclear morphology. Okay. But now that classification has gone usually. 
we pathologists do not use it now. Ah, so ma'am, even when we talk in terms of management, we don't need it to be classified as simple or hmm. complex because our management is also based exactly. on whether atypia is present, present or, or uh, not. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am, for enlightening me that how to recognize a pathology slide. So the second question says that a 59-year-old woman with uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension comes to the gynaeopathy with vaginal bleeding. She experienced a similar episode of bleeding two months ago, first time since menopause five years ago. She denies any other symptoms except these. She had normal menstrual cycles and gave birth to a child after a full-term normal delivery. She went through menopause at 54 years of age and was treated with HRT for 9 months due to severe hot flashes. Her BMI is 35. Endometrial biopsy obtained is shown below. The pathology is limited to the endometrium and is grade 1. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Now, as a student, when you see such a long question, you will start thinking that, oh my god, uh, it's a very tough question i'm going to attempt it later on but you don't understand that this is one of the most straightforward questions see read the second last line the endometrial biopsy is uh, the pathology is limited to the endometrium and is grade one that means where do you give grading you give grading in cancer right. right so it's going to be grade one cancer just a just a uh i mean that can be just a clue for all of you, right? That is why I always say, sometimes to save time, what you can do is read the first three lines of the question and the second last line. Because sometimes in the second last line, there's a very, very important clue for diagnosis, right? In this question, what are the keywords which you have? The age of the patient, uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, BMI is high, so there is obesity. Then there is postmenopausal bleeding, right? All these clues, as ma'am pointed out in the last question, they point towards some endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial malignancy because all of them are risk factors for that, right? And here we also have one, another very important clue and that is the age of the patient when she had menopause. Yeah. Normally, the age of menopause is 51 years worldwide. Now, in this female menopause is happening at 54 years of age which means it's a case of delayed menopause and that means this female was exposed to estrogen for a longer period of time okay that's right. a very important point which right. mama's and out. again excessive estrogen exposure whether it means mm. early menarche or whether there is late menopause both of them are risk factors for endometrial mm. cancer Right? Yeah. So, ma'am, what do we see in the slide? And, uh, ma'am, another question which I would like to ask you is, uh, it's given hormone replacement therapy for nine months was given to this patient. Does HRT also leads to increased risk of hyperplasia uh, or cancer? Yes, ma'am. Thankfully, you pointed this out. But so, HRT as such never leads to increased risk of endometrial cancer. It's a protective factor okay. for endometrial cancer because of the addition of progesterone there. You know, only if estrogen is given okay. in the form of HRT, that definitely leads to endometrial okay. cancer. But when estrogen and progesterone is given, that's a risk factor for breast cancer. Okay. It's not a risk factor for endometrial cancer. And that too, breast cancer happens because of the progesterone mm. Component, mm -hmm. Right. So, but that's not related over here. But yes, over here, they've given you history of HRT to give, you know, to add a little bit of confusion in your minds. So, uh, when you see this slide, uh, as I told in the you in the earlier slide, uh, what do you see? You can see back to back arrangement of glands. Can you people appreciate? There are much more glands. There is a proliferation of glands. There is very less stroma, right? So it has to be endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial cancer. Now, in this image, can you people appreciate these nuclei which are not normal? There is prominent nuclei. The nuclei are not perpendicular to the basement membrane, right? So I start thinking in terms of atypical endometrial hyperplasia or endometroid type of endometrial cancer, right? So here because the degree of nuclear atypia was much more and because there was a solid component of atypia also which was constituting less than 5% that is why we made a diagnosis of endometrial adenocarcinoma grade 1. Also it is given in the second last line in this question right mm -hmm. but as a pathologist what I would like to tell you is it is very difficult for us to differentiate atypical endometrial hyperplasias from 
form grade one endometrioid adenocarcinomas, right? Grade two and grade three are very easy to differentiate, but grade one is a little tough because you have to find out that solid component. Ma'am, can you please tell us because students generally tend to get, uh, you know, confused related to grades that what are the grades of uh, cancer and on a slide, how you can decide the grading of adenocarcinoma? Yeah. In grade one endometrial cancer, the solid component is less than 5%. In this image, can you people appreciate this is the back to back arrangement of glands and this is the glandular component. Whereas here, I can see this is the solid component of ATPR, right? right. So ma'am, whenever the solid component is less than 50 percent but okay. more than five percent we call it as grade two right it is between five to fifty percent the solid component it is grade two and as simple as that when the solid component or the solid portion constitutes more than fifty percent of the slide we call it as, call grade, it as grade three so less than five percent five to fifty percent and greater than fifty percent that's the criteria right right so grading is always an histopathological yes. uh, finding yeah. And the histopathologist is going to tell us what grade the cancer belongs yeah. to. Right. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. So let's proceed with the question. The question was saying that the pathology is limited to endometrium and, and is grade one. And as ma'am has told us that, that this is a case of endometroid ca uh, carcinoma and it is grade one. So now they are asking you what is the most appropriate next step in management. Now, once the biopsy report tells us that it is uh, endometrial cancer, we have to know the stage of the endometrial cancer because that is how our management is going to depend on. Now, staging in endometrial cancer, that's a surgical staging which you have to do. And the steps of surgical staging are that you have to go for a TAH and BSO. But if, you know, the cancer has involved cervix or any structure below the cervix, then you replace it, this simple hysterectomy with a more radical form of hysterectomy. Apart from doing hysterectomy, you have to go for a pelvic and a para-iotic lymph node dissection. But then, uh, you know, there are certain factors which decide that which kind of lymph node dissection you are going to do. For example, if the pathologist tells us that this is not adenocarcinoma, it is a papillary serous tumor or it is a clear cell cancer, then we call it as type 2 variety two, yes. of endometrial cancer. And in that case, definitely you have to do a pelvic and a para-iotic lymph node dissection. But if the pathology report tells us that it is type 1, that is adenocarcinoma, or endometroid variety, then you have to look at what grading the pathologist has given to that cancer. If the pathologist says that it is grade 3, then again you have to go for pelvic and para-iotic lymph node dissection. But if the pathology report says that it is grade 1 or grade 2, like in this question we have grade 1 endometroid variety of cancer, then you have to see whether extra uterine spread is present or not. If extra uterine spread is present, again, you go for a pelvic and para-iotic lymph node dissection. But if extra uterine spread is not present, like in this question, they are saying that the cancer is limited to the endometrium. That means it's limited to the uterus. Now, what we have to see is that whether this cancer has involved myometrium and how much percentage of myometrium has been involved. For that, you need an MRI report. Because if more than 50% of myometrium has been involved, again, you will go for a pelvic and para-iotic lymph node dissection. But if less than 50% of myometrium is involved, then you have to look at the size of the tumor. If size is more than 2 centimeters, you do a pelvic lymph node dissection. If size is less than 2 centimeters, you do not do any dissection at all. Okay, right? Mm -hmm. So over here in this question, they are saying that the pathology is limited to endometrium and is grade 1. They haven't mentioned how much myometrium is involved. Now, the options were that the next step is perform an MRI scan. Option B, TH plus BSO. Option C, TH plus BSO plus pelvic and paraiotic lymph node dissection. Option D, surgery followed by radiotherapy. Now, in this case, I do not know how much myometrium has been involved. So, I cannot tell you whether the correct answer will be option B or the correct mm -hmm. answer will be option C. And so, I will have to perform an MRI scan before I come to the diagnosis. So, the next step in the management will be perform an MRI scan. Mm -hmm. Right, ma'am? So, yeah. uh, 
very beautifully explained ma'am thank you oh ma'am thanks to you because earlier i did not understand anything about pathology and in class also i tell them that you know you see back to back arrangement of glands mm-hmm. you see a desmoplastic stroma <laughs> but exactly what it means and exactly how to look for it i have understood today <laughs> thank you ma'am. so coming to the next question a 56 year old woman presents with post menopausal bleeding Histoscopy and biopsy reveal an endometrial cancer which is confined to uterine fundus. Histology of the cancer is shown in the image. MRI scan reveals less than 50% of the myometrial invasion. What is the most appropriate treatment? Now, as uh, Ila Ma'am had pointed out in the previous question that you have to be smart enough to pick up the keywords. So over here, yes, we know that it is an endometrial cancer, but then that doesn't mean that without even looking at the slide you are going to to jump on to the treatment or the management part or you are going to jump on to whatever options are given see bachcho if a slide is given you have to know how to recognize that slide and what are the features you have to look in the slide now i can see that this slide is very different from what we saw in the previous yes. uh, few questions and ma'am is going to tell us that how the slide is different and what is the diagnosis here yeah So the first thing when I see the slide, I notice that there are no endometrial glands, yes, right? There are no glands. Hmm. That means this is not the endometrial type of adenocarcinoma. Right. This is not uh, type one endometrial cancer. This is definitely type two, right? So uh, that's the first thing which you have to remember. Then morphologically, you all know that type two endometrial cancer consists either of serous cells. or clear cells or mixed mullerian morphology right, right? so here in this image can you people appreciate these cells which do not have any nuclei i can't say any nuclei so these are actually clear cells right so i make a diagnosis as clear cell type of endometrial cancer that is type 2 right and uh, before progressing further then and knowing about management what i would like to tell you here is the differences between type 1 and type 2 endometrial cancer because any of these points which are given in this table can be asked to all of you or can be given in a clinical pathologic question as a keyword right so first of all what you have to look at as is the age of the patient i always say age can be contributory to solving a question it can not be 100 percent right many a time students tell me that ma'am uh, all you told that the age is f- between 15 to 39 years of age this patient is 45 years how can it be all so students that is just contributory you have to see the clinical features in the peripheral smear right that's the average age so here for a type 1 endometrial cancer the average age is 55 to 65 years whereas for type 2 it is 10 years higher up right okay then when the important thing which can be a keyword is the risk factors unopposed estrogen obesity diabetes and hypertension we have seen in the earlier questions they are risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia as well as type 1 endometrial cancers whereas they are not risk factors for type 2 Type 2 endometrial cancer usually arises in thin physique people and in a background of endometrial atrophy correct When we talk about morphology, histopathologically type one we have seen in the earlier questions, it is endometroid. You will see glands. Whereas in type two, what I am going to see is either serous or clear cell or mixed Mullerian morphology. Right. Another take home point from here is that the genetic or the gene which is involved in type one cancer is p10, whereas the gene involved in type two cancer is p53. That's a very very important point. Yes, ma'am, and I also tell them that p10 is the gatekeeper gene for uh, mm-hmm. endometrial cancers. Yes. And ma'am, I don't know about other cancers, but as far as gynae cancers are concerned, whether we are talking about endometrial cancer, whether we are talking about ovarian cancer or vulval cancer, any cancer where there is involvement of p10 gene, there is a mutation in p10 gene or KRAS gene mutation is seen. Generally, they are less aggressive and they okay. have a good prognosis. And anywhere where there is a gene mutation involving p53 gene mutation, they are more. aggressive and they have a poor prognosis and so is the case over here yes. 
right? Type 1 uh, endometrioid, uh, type 1 endometrial cancers have a good prognosis. Type 2, they have a Poor bad prognosis. prognosis. The one thing which I would like to point out over here again is that P10 gene mutation is seen in Cowden syndrome. Yes. Right? So, instead of telling you directly about P10 gene mutation, they can ask you that what is will be the prognosis of a patient with Cowden syndrome who has endometrial cancer. So, in Cowden syndrome, you are going to get type 1 variety exactly. of endometrial cancer. Similarly, in link syndrome, in link syndrome, you are going to get type 1 variety of endometrial cancers. Yes, yes. So, these are few things which you will have to remember. And they can be given in a clinical pathologic question right. as keywords also. Another thing to note here, which I always tell in the class, that P10 is present on chromosome number 10. That is how right. you remember and leads to Cowden syndrome. 10, right. P10, 10, 10, Cowden. Right? That's how you can remember. Right, ma'am. Another image which I would like to discuss here is this uh, image which shows the genetics of endometrial cancer, right? I'm presuming that this image can be asked in your future Central Institute exams, right? So just like the adenoma carcinoma sequence for colorectal cancer, this image shows the uh, progression of type 1 endometrial cancer. I have already told you it arises in endometrial hyperplasia. That's the risk factor. So here we have proliferative endometrium. The most important important gene we've already discussed p10 it leads to non-atypical hyperplasia right then this gene comes into play mlh1 what is mlh1 all of you know it's a mismatch repair gene which leads to microsatellite instability defects right then we have keras keras is an oncogene so sometimes you know the examiner plays with these keywords also P10 is a tumor suppressor gene, MLH1 is a mismatch repair gene, Keras is an oncogene, right? So this oncogene defect will lead to atypical hyperplasia and it will further lead to grade 1 type of endometrioid cancer. So this image can be asked and maybe they give a question mark on Keras and they can ask you a question with this image only, right? That's the progression of grade 1 endometrial cancer. Ma'am, I must compl uh, compliment all the pathologists and biochemistry teachers because you people have to know so much about gene mutations and this is one area which we don't understand. The, as an obstetrician, I will never be able to understand gene mutations <laughs> and I have to always mug them up for all the answers. <laughs> Uh, so this image shows the evolution of type 2 endometrial cancer. I've already told you it arises in atrophic endometrium. The important gene here, P53, leads to intraepithelial cancer and that leads to a serious kind of a carcinoma, right? Over to ma'am for the management. Okay, so ma'am, this over here, as you said, that over here we have a clear cell carcinoma. So the pathologist is telling me that this is a clear cell carcinoma. Now, whenever you have a pathologist report telling you that it's a clear cell carcinoma again you have to do the staging and staging again it has to be a surgical staging and I am going to go with a TH and BSO you'll ask me ma'am why TH and BSO because the pathology is limited to the endometrium that's what they are saying it's confined to the uterine fundus so here the cancer has not yet spread to the cervix so I'm not going to go for a radical hysterectomy just now I'm going to go for TH and BSO number one number two I told you that when I'm doing staging liprotomy along with doing TH and BSO I have to do lymph node dissection and if it is a type 2 variety I have to go for pelvic and paraiotic lymph node dissection but that is option B but if you see option C and option D in option C they have written followed by radiotherapy and in option D they have written followed by radiotherapy and chemo hormonal therapy so that means they are asking you the complete management of a uh, clear mm -hmm. cell carcinoma right so we are going to do a staging leprotomy and in all cases of endometrial cancer after staging we have to give them radiotherapy whether it is type 1 or whether it is type 2 variety of tumor the only uh, exception to this rule is that if it is an adenocarcinoma grade 1 or grade 2 and in that grade 1 grade 2 cancer the involvement of myometrium is less than 50 percent that means if it is stage 
स्टेज वन ए ऑफ एडिनो कार्सिनोमा ग्रेड वन और ग्रेड टू राइट ओनली इन दैट केस यू डोंट हैव टू डू अ रेडियोथेरेपी बिकॉज इफ इट इज स्टेज वन ए ग्रेड वन ग्रेड टू एडिनो कार्सिनोमा यू डोंट हैव टू गिव एनी रेडियोथेरेपी द अदर इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट विच यू हैव टू रिमेंबर इज दैट इन स्टेजेस थ्री एंड स्टेजेस फोर ऑफ एडिनो कार्सिनोमा एंड इन ऑल वेराइटीज ऑफ टाइप टू ट्यूमर्स because these are more aggressive tumors you don't only have to give radiotherapy you have to give chemo hormonal therapy right so over here this is a clear cell carcinoma so you are going to do tah plus bso plus pelvic and para aortic lymph node dissection followed by radiotherapy and chemo hormonal therapy and that's your answer the complete management and that is option d clear okay so let's go to the next question Next question is a 32 year old female she comes to the physician because of vaginal itching and malodorous discharge that is worse following her menses she is sexually active with two partners and recently had unprotected sex pelvic examination shows erythema of the cervix and malodorous frothy yellowish green discharge present in the cervical os and vaginal vault her pap smear is given below what is the next step in management of this patient so over here from the history itself you can tell what infection it is history is telling you that it is a yellowish green frothy discharge history is saying that it's a foul smelling discharge there is on examination you are getting erythema of uh, vagina and uh, cervix and they are telling you a pap smear showed the following thing see based on history i know what is the diagnosis but you have to know that based based on pap smear how do you diagnose different kinds of vaginitis now this question was asked in your aims exam in the inict exam mm -hmm. and one thing which they had written was that a pap smear was taken in this patient now can you tell me that is pap smear an investigation of choice whenever you get a patient with vaginal discharge no it's not See, pap smear is not the investigation of choice. Investigation of choice is saline microscopy. Then why was pap smear done over here? This is just an incidental finding. Maybe this female had come for a screening for cancer mm. cervix, right? Even if she did not come for screening for cancer cervix because of her history, mm. right? Because of her history that she has, uh, you know, sexual partners. She's sexually active with two partners. partners and any female who has multiple sex partners that is not only a risk factor for sexually transmitted diseases it is also a risk factor for cancer cervix mm. and that is why pap smear was done in this case so uh, now ma'am is going to tell us that how we are going to recognize various kinds of yes. organisms on pap smear so this is a very very important question sometimes it can be asked as a spotter also to right. you and sometimes they will give you a short history just the kind of discharge which mm -hmm. is present along with the pap smear image right, right. can be asked in any of the mcqs so please uh, you should know all these images right in this image very straightforward as ma'am said the keywords we have picked up there is erythem of the cervix and there is frothy yellow green discharge which is foul smelling right with these um, things what do you think ma'am what can with the diagnosis with oh, these with clinical. these things if the diagnosis is trichomonas trichomonas <laughs> right and when i see the pap smear then the gynecologist sends me this history when i see the pap smear i immediately start looking for this. i immediately see these organisms and what is this you can see a oval shaped organism with a eccentric nuclei that's a trichomonas so we make a diagnosis as trichomonas so like i always say the i sees what the mind knows right so all always look at the history of the patient when uh, we get such a history i start looking for trichomonas because that's the classical history right so that's how we identify the trichomonas now uh, another pap smear student in this image can you people appreciate these big nuclei 
with multiple nuclear nuclei right there is multi nucleation which is present right. then i can also see some margination of chromatin what is margination the chromatin goes to the margins of the nuclei right and i can see molding what do you mean by nuclear molding in pathology the nuclei mold into each other they mold into each other shapes like a jigsaw puzzle right so this these features are seen in herpes simplex infection genital herpes right three ends you have to remember students multinucleation margination and molding right and this appearance is called called as ground glass appearance why because when you see a glass painting it looks like this right i always say pathology is all about observation and imagination right, right. and we are very foodie so when i see the slide i start imagining fried eggs right i start imagining paintings ground glass right so it's a very colorful branch and a dreamy branch we are very dreamy people correct so uh, what you see is ground glass appearance of nuclei right here i would also like to tell you that there is a flash card in pathology which you have to remember two ground glasses right one you see in herpes simplex infection and another you see in hepatitis b infection right so the hepatocytes of hepatitis b shows ground glass appearance that's another mcq which is asked to all of you ma'am right? the way you've explained this slide i really want to go back to my undergraduate <laughs> time and i want to study pathology from you <laughs> so that i have a better understanding Thank of pathology so ma'am <laughs> So the next slide this is trichomonas very beautiful it looks very beautiful right oval shaped with eccentric nuclei normally you do not see such a, such a slide right it's right. not easy to diagnose correct then here this is a slide of bacterial vaginosis right it is caused by gardenella vaginalis right what you can see are these cells right and they are covered with some dirty material i would say shaggy shaggy means dirty material right, right. what is this dirty material this is actually cocobacilli that is gardenella vaginalis right so these cells are called as clue cells correct so that is seen in bacterial vaginosis right and all of you know that if clue cells they are more than 20% of the epithelial cells that's one of the very very important diagnostic criteria for am cells you know that's an am cell criteria and uh, this is one of the one of the criteria for the am cells criteria now in case of bacterial vaginosis the history which i'm going to send to ma'am is that the patient came to me who is having gray fresh white mal odorous discharge there won't be any clumping present mm. it will be a homogeneous discharge grayish white discharge it will be mal odorous and uh, it will be thinly coating the vagina that's the kind of history which i'm going to tell ma'am i'm specifically going to you know the patient is specifically going to mention to me that she doesn't have any pruritus if she doesn't mention that is a question which you have mm. to ask because in case of bacterial vaginosis there is no inflammation and yes. because there is no inflammation there is no pruritus and also because there is no inflammation if you see the polymorphonuclear leukocytes is to epithelial cell ratio mm. the polymorphonuclear leukocytes and the epithelial cell ratio is less than 1 so there will be very few polymorphonucleosides mm. in the exactly. uh, slide ma'am that also brings me to a point that i've always been telling them that polymorphonuclear leukocytes are very much seen in a slide with trichomonas hmm. so ma'am we see many trico uh, polymorphonucleosides in a yes. patient who's got trichomonas yes. vaginitis yes you can see a lot of them because it is associated with inflammation you can also uh, see leptothrix ma'am okay, leptothrix ma is also commonly associated with trichomonas infection so uh, here i would like to show you this slide uh, the uh, the uh, a patient having trichomoniasis along with leptothrix infection that appearance when we see a pap smear it is called as a sphagety and meatball appearance the sphagety appearance can you see these thin filamentous structures this is because of leptothrix okay. whereas the meatballs which they have said they are usually due to trichomonas so that's another thing which can be asked to all of you and as you said 
pathologist are foodies exactly they have to associate everything with food <laughs> that's i ma'am i feel that that's a very easy way to remember yes, otherwise i do agree to make it interesting otherwise yes. it will become very boring ha huh, because i remember you know uh, i have heard from you uh, talking about food but i remember dr rohan's one video where he had shown that donut yes yes <laughs> he actually showed a donut he actually showed a donut and i don't forget that now <laughs> Right. Uh, that's another image which I would like to show you. In this, uh, this is candida infection, uh, and you can see this hyphae, and you can also see candidal spores also on the slide, right? So these are the common types of uh, infections of the cervix and the vagina, which you can, can which can be given in your exams, ma'am. Ah, uh, this is from pathologist's eye. I am yeah. telling. Where students, you know, some cheat codes over here, yes. which I use exactly. Uh, they are suppose. You know, if you are getting this slide, and if the typical pear shape, you cannot, uh, you know, identify. In that case, just look at the arrow what they are pointing towards, and if your organism, whatever cell they are pointing towards, the size of that cell is smaller than the epithelial cells which are surrounding it, then you take it that it is a case of Trichomonas vaginalis. Whereas in case of Candidiasis. In candidiasis, if these hyphae are not that very prominent, you know, in the slide, what you have to look at is these small candida, the spores, spores which they have shown. Yes. The size of the spores will be smaller than the size of the nuclei of the epithelial cells, also, and that is how you can come to know that the slide which they have shown is that of. Candidiasis, and I'm talking of various other appearances. Again, a food sheik kebab appearance. Yes. So, ma'am, that sheesh kebab or sheik kebab appearance, I think that's also seen in candida. Yes, yes. Thank you for pointing out, ma'am. Uh, so, in candidiasis, the pseudo hyphae sometimes are arranged in such a manner that it looks like a sheesh kebab. I am actually a vegetarian, so ma'am is going to better elaborate uh, on yes, this. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, this is a typical sheesh kebab. Bob appearance where it appears as if the clumping has happened and the candida is appearing like a sea kebab, right? And um, I know next time when you are going to have a sea kebab, this is going to come to your mind. Yes. <laughs> okay, ma'am. So over here, the question was. Her pap smear is given below. What is the next step in the management of this patient? As ma'am told, that this is a case of Trichomonas vaginitis, and the management of Trichomonas vaginitis. That's a very simple thing. You have to give metronidazole, five hundred mg BD for seven days. Earlier, it was said that if you give a single dose of two grams metronidazole, that's also good. But now it has been seen that better uh, treatment and better results are obtained if you give five hundred mg BD for seven days. Now, even if Your female is pregnant. Then also the drug of choice is metronidazole. And here again, I want to point out that earlier it was said that in first trimester of pregnancy, metronidazole shouldn't be used. But now it is said that yes, metronidazole can be used in first trimester of pregnancy also. And before we go to the next question, just two very important things: the investigation of choice whenever a patient comes to you with vaginitis is saline microscopy. That's one. One thing, number two. Whenever a patient with vaginal discharge comes to you, we go for syndromic management of yes. vaginal discharge. And in syndromic vaginal uh, management of vaginal discharge, we give kit number two to the patient. And this kit number two is a green kit. It has got tablet fluconazole. Tablet secnidazole is going to take care of infections like bacterial vaginosis and trichomonas, and fluconazole is going to take care of candidiasis. Thank you, ma'am. So let's move to the next question. A forty-five-year-old female, G three P three, comes to our physician with complaints of heavy and painful menstrual bleeding. She has been experiencing experiencing these symptoms for the past four months. She explains that her last menstrual period was twenty days ago. Menarche was at age eleven, and she has regular twenty-nine day cycles. She is sexually active with her boyfriend and denies any pain during intercourse. Her past history is notable for a bilateral tubal ligation five years ago. She does not take any medicines and denies the usage of alcohol, tobacco. The patient's vital signs are unremarkable. During a physical examination, the physician notices that her uterus is uniformly enlarged. A urine beta HCG is performed and is negative. 
The patient undergoes an endometrial biopsy which reveals the finding below. What is the most likely cause for this patient's symptoms? Now, there are a lot of keywords in this question which ma'am is going to just elaborate on. See, over here, this is a 44-year-old female who is G3, P3 and she is coming to you with heavy and painful bleeding, right? So, she is having secondary dysmenorrhea and she is having menorrhagia. That's one very important thing. Then the other very important thing which they have given is that when we did a per vaginal examination, you are getting a uniformly enlarged mm. uterus. These two are very important before you look at what the uh, you know histopathology slide is going to tell you, which ma'am is going to tell yeah. what it is looking like, what we are seeing here. So when we uh, get such a history along with this slide, we become very happy because it's a very, very straightforward diagnosis. Uh, can you people appreciate these glandular structures are there? Now, what can be these glandular structures? Endometrial glands, endometrial of course. Glands, right? Yes, ma'am. Now, all these endometrial glands, I can see that they are surrounded by this area. And this area is not endometrial stroma. This does not mm -hmm. look like endometrial stroma. This look like muscle, right? So, that means this is myometrium, correct? So, this area is myometrium and these are endometrial glands. So, when you see endometrial glands inside the myometrium, what is it called as? Very straightforward. That's an adenomyosis. Yes. So, the slide has told you that it's a case of adenomyosis. So, over here, the options given were endometriosis, adenomyosis, primary dysmenorrhea and endometrial cancer. Endometrial cancer is not the diagnosis. You all know that how a slide of endometrial cancer exactly. is going to look like. In case of endometriosis, you are not going to get a uniformly enlarged uterus, right? Here, in case of endometriosis, the the uterus is normal in size and it is a fixed uterus and generally you get bilateral adenexal mass or uh, tenderness is felt in the yes. adenexa because of the chocolate, chocolate cyst, cyst. Right? Also, endometriosis is a problem which is seen generally in reproductive age females between mm. 27 to 30 years and their main complaint is secondary dysmenorrhea. Whereas, in case of adenomyosis, it's a problem of more multiparous females the most common age group is around 45 years of age and patient comes to you with two complaints. You know, patient is going to, typical history patient is going to give that she is having heavy bleeding and she is having pain during menstruation. So, menorrhagia and secondary dysmenorrhea both are a common presentation of adenomyosis. In your MCQs, if you have to pick up one, that which is the most common symptom in adenomyosis, then the most common symptom is menorrhagia. Now, whenever a patient of adenomyosis comes to you, the first investigation which you do whenever you are suspecting adenomyosis is ultrasound because an ultrasound you're going to get small small hints that it is a case of adenomyosis i am not going to discuss the ultrasound images of adenomyosis over here in this question just now because ma'am we have a session with dr mayur also <laughs> so you will have to watch that session to understand what yes. are the ultrasound features of adenomyosis Right now, after ultrasound, the investigation of choice in case of adenomyosis is MRI. And again, uh, Dr. Mayur is a better person to tell you that how you are going to uh, diagnose adenomyosis on MRI. Now, once the diagnosis is made, the management of adenomyosis is that you have to go for total abdominal hysterectomy. And once we do the hysterectomy, we send the sample to the histopathologist who then confirm that yes, it was a case of adenomyosis. So, if they ask you what is the gold standard method for diagnosing uh, adenomyosis, then your answer is histopathological examination. And on histopathology is very straightforward. Endometrial glands inside the myometrial stroma and we see that the distance from basalis is 2 to 3 mm. But that won't be asked to all of you. That's a little uh, extra thing that won't be there in your exams. You just have to know if you see glands inside the myometrium, it is adenomyosis. Correct? Right, ma'am. 
Let's see question number six. In question number six, we have a 37 year old female who comes to gynecology with complaint of postcoital bleeding. Her last menstrual period was six weeks ago. The first episode of bleeding happened six months ago. Initially, it was episodic, but now she has been bleeding after every intercourse. Her last delivery was five years back and was uneventful. On examination, vitals are normal. On per speculum examination, following was seen. So, what are you seeing on a per speculum examination? You are seeing over here this pink colored uh, epithelium and this pink color over here denotes your exocervix and what I am seeing is this red color. Now, wherever red color is present on per speculum examination, that denotes endocervix. And what is evident over here is that endocervix has moved out of the external os and it is covering the uh, exocervix, right? So, this could be a case of ectropion also. And one more thing which they could have given you on per speculum examination is that these areas, they are, you know, they bleed on touch. They are very fragile areas. So, on per speculum examination, bleeding could have been present, right? On per vaginal examination, you get a normal size antiverted, antiflexed uterus. Her pap smear showed the following image. Now, before uh, ma'am tells us how to identify the image, let us look at the pointers which were given in the question. We have a 37-year-old female who's coming to you with post-coital bleeding, which is a very, very specific test for cancer cervix. And whenever a female comes to you with post-coital bleeding, next step is you have to go for a pap smear, right? So very rightly in this patient, a pap smear was done. And ma'am is going to tell us what we can see on this pap smear. So, when you see this pap smear, the first thing we notice is it does not show the normal squamous epithelial cells, right? Okay. Normally, in pap smear, what do you see? You see the epithelial cells at various degrees of maturation with a small nuclei, right? Here, what I see are these big nuclei and the slide is extremely blue, right? Everybody yes, can notice the slide is extremely blue. Blue, malignant, boys. <laughs> please but later on don't troll us for this <laughs> yes right. so um, these are blue cells right so that means it usually indicates atpr right so what is there you can clearly notice the nuclear enlargement right and somewhere you can see prominent nucleoli also hmm. so whenever we see nuclear pyomorphism nuclear atpr nuclear megaly prominent nucleoli and dispersed chromatin what does it indicate it indicates atpr right so what it can be it can be squamous intraepithelial lesion so either it can be l cell or it can be etzel, right? The distinction between elsin and etzel is a little tough, right? It's very subjective because it depends upon the pathologist's experience also, okay, right. right? So, uh, it is usually done on the basis of how much nuclear pyomorphism and ATPR is present. If it is quite high, we make a diagnosis of etzel. If it is less, we make a diagnosis of elsel. See, ma'am, you are a pathologist. You have an eye for those kinds kind of uh, changes which are happening but this I believe is a low power slide and if you ask me what I can see over here is blue color and I can see yes the nuclei are enlarged yeah. but the intricate features I am unable to uh, yeah. differentiate or I cannot see those features if you can show a high power slide yeah. as well sure so in this image see how beautifully you can see high NC ratio. When I teach the basics of neoplasia, I always tell that what is a very, very important indicator of malignancy, high NC ratio. Normally, the NC ratio is 1 is to 4. In malignancies or atypia, it reaches 1 is to 1. So, you see high NC ratio. Yes, you can see hyperchromasia, very yes, dense blue. You can also see these nucleoli. All these yes. empty things which you see inside, there are nucleoli. And this chromatin, you can see it is totally dispersed. This is characteristically called as the vesicular chromatin. So, okay. which indicates a malignant cell, atypical cell, right? So, these are the features which you see. And that is why in when I got this image, I gave the diagnosis as itself. Okay, so over here, the pathologist has told us that this is an image of 
एच सेल सो पैप्समेर रिपोर्ट इज टेलिंग मी दैट देर इज एच सेल बट पैप्समेर इज अ स्क्रीनिंग मेथड एंड एज मैम सेड टू डिफ्रेंशिएट बिटवीन एल सेल एंड एच सेल यू नीड अ पैथोलॉजिस्ट आई राइट सो ओवर हियर वेन द रिपोर्ट हैज कम हैज एच सेल आई हैव टू डू अ कन्फर्मेटरी टेस्ट एंड कन्फर्मेटरी टेस्ट फॉर एनी काइंड ऑफ मेलेग्नेंसी इज ऑलवेज अ बायोप्सी सो इफ यू आर गेटिंग द पैथोलॉजी रिपोर्ट एज एच सेल और इफ यू आर गेटिंग the report as atypical squamous cells where hisl cannot be differentiated mm-hmm. which is yes. called as asch hmm. in both these cases no matter what is the age of the patient you don't have to see the age of the patient the next step always is that you have to do a colposcopy and because in colposcopy the endocervix is not visible that is why you are going to do a colposcopic guided biopsy and you are going to go for endocervical assessment but suppose if the report comes as lsil or if the report comes as ascus hmm. ma'am the places That's where you people tell yeah. that it is atypical squamous cells of unknown significance now in that case in those cases you know the age of the patient matters a lot if age of the patient is more than 25 years then in case of lsil you have to do a colposcopy in case of ascus you have to do an hpv dna testing which is called as a reflex dna testing but if age of the patient is less than 25 years in that case whether the report is lsil or whether the report is ascus you have to repeat the pap smear in 6 months to 1 year time right so these are your ASCCP guidelines the american society for colposcopy and cervical pathology guidelines Ma'am, if you allow me, uh, ASCCP have given new guidelines in the year 2020, and they are updated, which I have not told them. There are three or four points which ma'am, I quickly please. want to tell them. Yes, ma'am, sure, please. Okay, so uh, ASCCP they have said that we have to go for expedite treatment. Although this term expedite treatment was given in the ASCCP guidelines of 2012 also, but then they did not tell us that in what category of patients ex. expedite treatment has to be done what do you mean by expedite treatment is those cases where you do not have to wait for the colposcopy biopsy result and you can proceed to management immediately what is that case number 1 if you have a patient with hsil and the patient has to be non pregnant and her hpv dna is testing positive for hpv 16 now all of us know that hpv 16 is the most common hpv associated with cancer yes. cervix so if you are getting the report as hsil on pap smear and there is hpv dna 16 present then in that case you don't have to wait for a colposcopy result you can proceed to treatment number 1 number 2 if you have a patient in whom you she never got her you know any screening done and she gets a screening done for the first time and her report comes as hsil and any of the hpv is is positive hpv dna is positive for any of them then in that case you, again you can go for expedite treatment in this case it is not specific that it has to be hpv 16 it can be any hpv which is positive which is associated with cancer cervix the high risk varieties of hpv The second very important thing which they told is that suppose there is a female in whom HPV 16 or 18 is present and her pap smear report is coming out to be normal. Now because HPV 16 and 18 they have high associations with cancer cervix so in this case you have to go for colposcopy even though the pap smear report may be normal. That's the second change which has come in guidelines. The third change which has come in guidelines is that initially it was said that suppose you have a patient in whom the pap smear report was HSIL and uh, her colposcopy showed CIN2 or CIN3 or it showed uh, you know adenocarcinoma in that case even after you have treated the patients you have to follow up them up with co-test and co-test has to be done after every 5 years but now the guidelines specifically say that in all these cases you have to do a co-test and this co-test has to be done after every 3 years and not every 5 years and you have to keep screening them 
them for at least 25 years after you have treated them. So minimum number of period for which you have to screen them is 25 years and you have to do a co-test after every three years. The last very important change which has come in these guidelines is that suppose you have a female in whom over the past five years her screening was absolutely normal but suddenly you know you get a report as HPV DNA present. Now in this case if HPV DNA is present you take it as a new infection rather than as a persistent infection. Any new infection of HPV is you have to do screening you have to keep them under screening. It is only persistent HPV infection which all of you know that it leads to CIN or cancer cervix. So these patients we are not going to say that they are persistent HPV infections. We are going to call them as new HPV infections if in the past five years their screening was negative and all of a sudden their HPV DNA is coming positive and you don't have to do colposcopy in them. You have to go continue the screening in them. So these are very important changes uh, which have come in these guidelines and they are very, very important for your upcoming INI CET exam. Thank you, ma'am, for enlightening <laughs> So we have a continuation of the same question, ma'am. In the same patient as question 6, colposcopic directed biopsy was done because as ma'am told, it was HSIL. So we had to do a colposcopic directed biopsy, which showed the following. Now they have given you an image of the biopsy, which ma'am is going to tell us how to interpret. And they've asked, what is the next step in management? So when we got this biopsy, the first thing that we notice is the intact basement membrane. You can all appreciate that the basement membrane is intact, yes, right? If the basement membrane is intact, it indicates that the malignant cells are limited by the basement membrane. They have not crossed the basement membrane. That means the patient does not have invasive cancer, right? Right. right, right. So another point which I would like to tell you here is that, uh, you know, as a pathologist, many a times I have difficulty in differentiating whether it is an in situ cancer or it is an invasive cancer, right? Okay. So in all those circumstances, what I do is I tell the technician to apply, to do a pass stain, right? Pass is a stain for basement membrane. If I see the intact magenta colored beautiful basement membrane, I say that this is in situ, uh, I mean in situ cancer. And if you see breaks in that basement membrane, we say it is invasive cancer. Okay, ma'am. Yes. So here when I got this biopsy, I could see these basal cells or immature cells, they are occupying more than one third of the epithelium. This looks normal. They are occupying more than one third. So I make a diagnosis that this is CIN2, right? So we send this biopsy as CIN2. Thank you so much, ma'am. So once the report comes as CIN2, now we know that this is a definitive diagnosis and you know that the management of CIN2 in any age group, it is LEEP. Hysterectomy is not done for CIN usually. The usual management is loop electroexcisional procedure or LLETZ, that is large loop excision of transformation zone. So over here, the answer will be option B. So but you, now you can see that most of the cases are such that unless and until you have a sound knowledge of pathology with just knowing the basics of gynae you are not able to solve those questions you have to know your pathology then only you can come to a diagnosis and then only you can tell the management and this is what integration is all about that's why we got this session for all of you and we'll keep on getting more such sessions in future right so uh Next question. Oh, ma'am, that's a very long stem question. <laughs> okay. So next question. It states that a 30-year-old G4P3L3 with 32 weeks pregnancy with single life fetus in kephalic presentation, patient complains of easy fatigability and weakness since the last three months, right? Which has gradually increased over the last 15 days to an extent that she gets tired on doing household activities, right? Patient also complains of breathlessness on exertion since last 15 days. Patient gets breathless on climbing two flights of stairs it is not associated with palpitations or any chest pain so we are ruling out any cardiac abnormality there is no history of pedal edema sudden onset breathlessness cough or decreased urinary output 
Right. There is no history of asthma or chronic cough. There is no history of fever or children rigors. There is no history of passage of worms in the stool or uh, blood loss from any site. There is no history of any bru easy bruisability or petechiae. There is no history of yellow discoloration of urine, skin or eyes. She did not take iron folate prophylaxis throughout her pregnancy. Now that's very important. Yes. So see the second last line. Very, right. very important. She is suspected to be anemic and her blood sample was ordered for examination, which showed the hemoglobin of the patient was 6.4. So, see, classically, the history of this patient and the hemoglobin suggest that the patient has anemia. Right. So, from uh, integration of pathology with gynae, we have moved to integration of pathology to obstetrics. Yeah. Right. Now, uh, they have ruled out all causes of, uh, you know, fatigue and tiredness. In this COVID pandemic, I just want to add for all the final year students who are listening to us that they have said that there is no history of chronic fever. You also have to take history of being exposed to uh, COVID-19, any COVID-19 contact you've come in contact with any COVID-19 patient or also you know history of any acute fever any short history of fever mm -hmm. also has to be taken keeping in view the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic right the hematocrit of the patient was 22 percent that is less peripheral smear shows this image naked eye single tube red cell osmotic fragility test is negative that's the Nestroff test what is the next step in management of the patient now so classically students with this history and hemoglobin level we start thinking in terms of iron deficiency anemia right more so because the history is being said in the history they are saying that she hasn't taken iron folic acid profile axis. exactly right plus uh, an extra point which they have given here is that the Nestroff test is negative now why uh, why have they pointed out the Nestroff test because Nestroff test is a screening test for thalassemia Thalassi right so they wanted to rule out that whether the patient has thalassemia trait or not and that's very important in a pregnant female we, um, as a rule, we always tell the pregnant females to get their hemoglobin electrophoresis done or thalassemia screening done. And we all know the reason why. Because if the female is a carrier who was undiagnosed till now and her husband is also a carrier who was undiagnosed till now and uh, so the child has some chance that the child can have thalassemia major. major. And you don't want your child to have thalassemia major. It's a severe disease, right? That is why thalassemia screening is very important important in pregnancy right so the significance of them giving nestroff line is to rule out thalassemia now when i look at this peripheral smear what do i see classically students all doctors should know this slide microcytic hypochromic red blood cells as a doctor because you know iron deficiency anemia is the most common anemia in india right especially in prepubertal females or pregnant females it's very very common right. so that's why it's very important to know this slide so in this can you appreciate these cells they are smaller and there is hypochromia microcytic means small Smaller. hypochromic means the central uh, one-third pallor is more right normally RBCs are central one-third pallor here they are much more pale right you right. can see in all these few pencil cells you know sometimes in iron deficiency anemia you can see pencil cells they look like a pencil here I can see one cell which looks like a pencil right so these cells are a characteristic feature of iron deficiency anemia microcytic hypochromic anemia correct so so I make a diagnosis that this patient has iron deficiency anemia ma'am is going to tell you the management now okay so they are asking you what is the management now before you go to the management there are two things which are important to know number one what is the gestational age of the patient the gestational age of the patient is 32 weeks and number two what is her hemoglobin level and a hemoglobin level is given as 6.4 grams which means it's a case of severe anemia now how do we treat anemia in pregnancy 
to for treating anemia in pregnancy we follow our national guidelines and this algorithm which i'm sharing with you is based on our national guidelines our national guidelines say that if there is mild or moderate anemia in pregnancy then the second thing which you have to look at is the gestational age of the patient if gestational age of the patient is less than 34 weeks and there is mild or moderate anemia the management is that you have to give oral iron now for prophylactic purpose we give one tablet of oral iron and folic acid per day but for treatment for therapeutic purposes we give at least two tablets of oral iron per day right but if the gestational age of the patient is more than equal to 34 weeks then the treatment of choice is parenteral iron not because that the increase in hemoglobin will be faster with parenteral iron that's not the case the increase in hemoglobin with oral iron and with parenteral iron is same the reason that why after 34 weeks we give parenteral iron is because now at this point of time I am not going to rely on the patient. I am not going to rely on whether she is compliant or not. Parenteral iron I am going to give so I know definitely her hemoglobin is going to increase after parenteral iron. As far as oral iron is concerned I am dependent upon the compliance of the patient. Right? Now in case of severe anemia you have to look at the hemoglobin of the patient. If hemoglobin of the patient is less than 5 grams at any gestational age management always is blood transfusion. But if hemoglobin is between 5 to 6.9 less than 7 is severe hemoglobin as uh, is severe anemia. So if hemoglobin is between 5 to 6.9 in that case you have to look for ge uh, the gestational age. If gestational age is more than 34 weeks then you go for blood transfusion and if gestational age is less than 34 weeks, you go for parenteral iron. In this case, the hemoglobin was 6.4 and the gestational age of the patient was 32 weeks. That means it's less than 34 weeks. So my answer would be parenteral iron. Please do not mark the answer as blood transfusion. That's incorrect, right? So uh, ma'am, let us go to the next, next question. question yeah. Yes, ma'am. So here we have a 24 year old G3P2 female at 32 weeks of pregnancy. She has BP of 126 by 84 millimeter mercury. She complains of pain in the epigastrium, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite and malaise. Her lab findings are bilirubin 2.6 milligram per deciliter that's high. SGOT, SGPT high again. LDH very high. Platelet count 1 lakh that is low and her PBS shows the following image. Now before I tell you about the peripheral blood smear, young pregnant female who complains of uh, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, jaundice plus raised LDH and low platelet count. So that's the clinical history and these are the cleavers which are there. Now ma'am, with this history, what all can we think of? What can we think of in this patient? Okay, so you have a patient who's coming to you in third trimester of pregnancy and she's complaining to you of pain in abdomen and there is pain in epigastrium. She's complaining to you of nausea and vomiting and her bilirubin levels are raised, mm -hmm. right? So with this kind of a history, uh, you have to keep two, three differential diagnoses in your hand. Number one, it could be a case of hepatitis. Number one. Number two, it could be a case of AFLP, that is acute fatty right. liver of pregnancy, mm -hmm. or it could be a case of HELP syndrome. These are the three differential diagnoses which I, I am going to keep in my mind before I proceed to the peripheral blood smear. And I'm going to tell you what these findings are telling and what they are pointing towards. But first, First, let's have a look at the peripheral blood yeah. smear. So when we see the peripheral smear, these are the normal RBCs, right? I just told you that there is central one-third pallor and they are not microcytic. The size is totally appropriate, appropriate, right? Now, you can see these cells. When such cells are given, when this kind of image is given students in the exam, we are very clear. See the shape of these cells. These are basically 
helmet cells can you people appreciate they are the shape of a helmet so these are called as helmet cells the other name for a helmet cell is also a schistocyte or they are also called fragmented red cells why because they are caused when the rbc's goes through a blood vessels they get fragmented and these various shapes are formed right, right. so that is why these are the three names for these cells ma'am the peripheral yeah. blood smear you are saying is showing us schistocytes or helmet, helmet cells, cells yeah. right now Now, with this kind of a history, let us rule out what it is. You know, I know with the you know cystocytes and helmet cells on peripheral blood smears, you people are smart enough to know that the diagnosis is HELP syndrome, right? And uh, for HELP syndrome, one thing which I want to tell you uh, is I want to point out that mostly in eighty to eighty-five percent cases of HELP syndrome, BP of the patient is high, but there are fifteen to twenty percent cases in whom the BP of the patient is normal and this is one of those cases okay. where bp is normal so please remember that in help syndrome bp may be normal in 15 to 20% cases that's one so bp is not high bp is not a criteria for diagnosing help syndrome that's one thing second thing which i want to point out over here is that nulliparity is a risk factor for pih all of you know that it is more common in primary gravida females but nulliparity is not a risk factor for help syndrome that's second thing which i want you to know third thing which i want you to know is that with a patient of help syndrome mostly the patient is going to present to you with pain in epigastrium that will be one of the very common complaints which you are going to get in a patient of help syndrome now how do you diagnose help syndrome that is based on a criteria which is called as the tennessee's criteria right and according to tennessee's criteria all of you know that h stands for hemolysis el stands for elevated liver enzymes and how much elevated more than two times their normal value and lp stands for low platelet count and the platelet count has to be less than 1 lakh right but when we say hemolysis for uh, knowing whether hemolysis has occurred or not there are four criterias which you have to look and if any of the two criterias which i'm going to tell you now if they get fulfilled then you say that hemolysis has happened number 1 is if peripheral blood smear shows you schistocytes or ber cells and as in the in the question which was given to us the peripheral blood smear was showing us schistocytes ma'am once i complete this criteria i would also want to know how a ber cell looks like surely ma'am then number 1 number 2 criteria for hemolysis is if serum bilirubin levels are more than equal to 1.2 and over here in the question the hemo serum bilirubin levels is 2.6 so definitely it is more than 1.2 third is if the levels of ldh are raised and if the levels of haptoglobin are decreased so in the question it was given to us that the levels of ldh are 710 so a again the levels of ldh are raised the third three criteria are fulfilled and number 4 severe anemia which is unrelated to blood loss so if out of these four any two are fulfilled then we say hemolysis has happened and in this patient we are getting serum bilirubin more than equal to 1.2 we are getting on peripheral blood smear uh, schistocytes and we are getting high ldh apart from that the liver enzymes are raised and we have low platelet count so this is a case of help syndrome and before i proceed to the management of help syndrome because that's what the question was asked ma'am if you could please tell us yeah. how a ber cell looks yeah. like so in this image can you people appreciate these cells that's a rbc with blunt projections correct right so when you see a rbc with blunt pro projection that is called as a ber cell b for blunt and b for ber that is how you can remember right and these ber cells are usually seen in uremia or chronic renal failure okay right and then it is also very important for us to differentiate this ber cell from this cell which is called as a acanthocyte right how we do, how do we differentiate that's a cell with pointed projection mm -hmm. it's like this the projections are not blurred so these have pointed projections right. these are acanthocytes and where do you see acanthocytes a beta lipoproteinemia these are the one liners which can be asked in some of the regional exams right 
Uh, one extra thing which I would like to tell you here is that in which all conditions do you see schistocytes, right? right? So if you get this image in the MCQ exam, what all DDs, except for gyne DDs, what all things which you right. uh, will keep in your mind, it they are seen in all cases of microangiopathic hemolytic anemias, right? For example, HUS, that is hemolytic uremic syndrome, TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, right? So in all those cases, you can see these cystocytes, correct? Right. So over here, we've made a diagnosis of HELP syndrome. Now the question further is asking you, what is the management of this patient? And your options are conservative management with corticosteroids, IV fluids and induction of labor at 37 weeks of pregnancy. Option B, image at cesarean section. Option, option C, injection corticosteroid and delivery after 48 hours. Option D, image at induction of labor. Please remember that HELP syndrome is an emergency and whenever there is HELP syndrome, you have to deliver the patient. Now, if your patient is more than equal to 34 weeks of pregnancy, you have to go for immediate induction of labor. But if your patient's gestational age is less than 34 weeks, then I'm going to give them corticosteroids and I'm going to wait for 40, 48 hours so that the lungs of the fetus are mature and then I'm going to go for delivery. So over here in this option, the uh, uh, correct answer is option C, injection corticosteroid and delivery after 48 hours. Now, as ma'am had asked me at that time, um, what are the differential diagnoses which you have in your mind? One of the differential diagnoses was acute fatty liver of pregnancy. See, acute fatty liver of pregnancy patients can have the same kind of presentation. But again, in acute fatty liver, there will be other features as well. In acute fatty liver, there will be features of renal failure also. Mm -hmm. So it's a hepatorenal syndrome where they will tell you that the serum creatinine levels are high, ammonia levels are high. And because of all this, there will be, you know, confusion in the mind of the patient. There will be hypoglycemia, which will be mentioned there. And, you know, they, you can have keywords like patient has got secondary complications like pancreatitis or diabetes insipidus. Mm. Right. So all these features would be there in patients of acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Whereas in patients of hepatitis, Joindus is going to be much more than what we have here. There will be fever and the liver enzymes will be very high. The, the, you know, the levels of liver enzymes would be much higher than what we have here. Here we have SGOT, SGPT, 100 international units, but there we are going to have very high levels of SGOT and SG. PT. As far as cholestasis of pregnancy is concerned, that can also be one of your differential diagnoses. But in cholestasis of pregnancy, the main complaint of the patient is pruritus, which is mm. morely seen in the peripheral parts, you know, in the palms and in the soles. And there is increased bile acids. So that is also going to be there, which is missing in this case. So it's not a case of cholestasis. It's a clear cut case of HELP syndrome. Right. So, ma'am, we have the last and the final question yes. for today's session. So, coming to the last question of the session and our path OBG integration would not be complete without integration of pathology and gynae knowledge on ovarian cancer. Exactly. <laughs> so, the last question is related to an ovarian mass. Let's read it. A 35-year-old Nully Paris female. She's 35 years old. She's Nully Paris who desires future fertility and she presents with a right-sided adenexal mass. Right now, at exploratory replotomy, a mass is seen in right ovary. The histopathology shows the following image. What is the appropriate surgical management? Now, before ma'am starts explaining to us the image, please be uh, very careful about the age of the patient. Now, at 35 years of age, if a female is having an ovarian cancer, what all can you think about? Can it be an epithelial cell uh, cancer of the ovary? No, epithelial cell cancers of the ovary do not present at 35 years of age. So it could be a germ cell tumor, although the most common age group for germ cell tumors, it's very common in young females around 20 years of age, or 
or it could be a sex cord stromal tumors the most common age group for a sex cord stromal uh, tumor is perimenopausal age but yes it can be seen uh, you know in young females and it can be seen in post menopausal females also so in my mind i have either it's a germ cell tumor or it is a case of sex cord stromal tumor right so with this background i'm going to ask ma'am to tell us how this slide what this slide is showing us so whenever we have a ovarian mass students we always th have eight or nine characteristic images right? right they have very characteristic microscopic profiles yes, and particular markers right so we always go in that direction now uh, so first of all let's see the characteristic images and then i'll tell you what this image looks like right, right? So when I see this image, you can see these structures, they are papillary, right? Mm -hmm. Anything papillary in pathology, what do you mean by that? That means a finger-like projection with a fibrovascular core, right? So these are the papillary, uh, papillary which I see. Plus students, the characteristic thing which I see here are these basophilic bodies. These are called as samoma bodies, right? You can see they are dense basophilic purple in color. They are okay. samoma bodies. The moment I see samoma body, it's a serous cyst adenocarcinoma, right? So another flashcard which comes in your exams is samoma bodies are seen in which all conditions, right? So you can have a clinical pathologic history and there can be image of samoma bodies and you will be asked in which all conditions is a scene right so you have papillary carcinoma thyroid papillary renal cell carcinoma meningiomas serous stadenocarcinoma ovary mesotheliomas these are the conditions in which you can see samomas right and because uh, ma'am serous cyst adenocarcinoma is the most common variety of exactly. epithelial ovarian tumors so in general you know the general thing which we say is that samoma bodies are seen in epithelial cell tumors yes. but specifically you should remember that it is seen in serous, serous cyst adenocarcinoma yeah. Next, very beautiful and characteristic image students. If it is given in the exam, it's a direct diagnosis, Brenner's tumor. What do you see? Here, what I can see is this normal looking ovarian stroma, right? This right. is how ovarian stroma looks like. But what is characteristic here are these nests of cells. Can you people right. appreciate these nests? And these nests of cells characteristically look like the normal transitional epithelium. Remember the urinary bladder transitional epithelium, how it looks like? Normal histology? Yes, ma'am. These nests looks like that. So these are the foci of transitional epithelium which are resting in ovarian stroma. This is seen in Brenner's tumor. And ma'am, this has got a typical name, Walthard cell Walthard nest. Walthard cell nest, yes. yes. Next, this slide has been asked in your INICET exams and different exams many right. times along with the clinical history, whether it's a male, whether it's a seminoma in a male or a dysgerminoma in a female, right? So what you see in a dysgerminoma are these polyhedral cells, right? But important thing to notice here are these cells are arranged in nests. So you have these nests of cells, one nest, second nest. These nests, you can appreciate they are separated by these fibrous septa. So I can appreciate that these are the fibrous septa which are there. And the characteristic feature is students, a lot of inflammatory infiltrate, right? So in these fibrous septa, you see lymphocytes, lymphocytic okay. infiltrate. So this is seen in dysgerminoma. Last time when this question was asked, the marker was also given. The marker which we usually use for a dysgerminoma or a seminoma is PLAP, that is placental alkaline phosphatase, phosphatase. right? Uh, so ma'am, we here in whenever they will get an image of dysgerminoma, there will be a lot of fibrous septa and there will be infiltration lymphocytes. of uh, lymphocytes and there will be many cells which will be dispersed exactly. there. Okay, uh, students, just one thing which I want all of you to remember is that if they ask you which is the most common germ cell tumor, please do not say that it's a germin or dysgerminoma. That is not the most common malignant germ cell tumor. The most common malignant germ cell tumor is an immature teratoma. The second most common is dysgerminoma. But yes, it is the germ cell tumor which has got the best prognosis. Mm -hmm. Then, this image can also be asked in your future questions. 
this is something which is called as a schiller dual body right what is a schiller dual body can you people appreciate these are rbcs in the center so this is a blood vessel so a single layer of tumor cell outside a blood vessel and another layer outside this so two layers of tumor cells surrounding a blood vessel right now this looks like a glomerulus right so schiller dual bodies are also called as glomeruloid bodies right what is a glomerulus it's a tough tough capillaries here you can see tumor cells around the capillary so this is a glomeruloid body another thing to remember two glomeruloid bodies in pathology right one yolk sac tumor another glioblastoma multiforme two in histopathology correct and what is the marker which will be given in a clinical pathologic question alpha fetoprotein they are afp positive right and uh, about the yolk sac tumor like i told you that this germinomas they have the best prognosis amongst the germ cell tumors yolk sac tumors they have the worst prognosis amongst the germ cell uh, tumors it is also called as an endodermal sinus tumor right then that's a very characteristic slide which even when we see the gross specimen we can directly say that that's a teratoma right if you're a second year student you get a wear and mass and you see a cystic structure or a ovary with teeth cartilage bone hair we say it's a teratoma right so even when you see a slide in such a patient what you see is different uh, kinds of epithelium or bone or cartilage right so here in this image i can see this is the bony element which is there and this are the fibroblasts which is there this is the epithelium element which is there and these are the sebaceous glands which are there right so when you see the Uh, uh, cells in various stages of differentiation ectoderm mesoderm endoderm all derivatives in one slide we make a diagnosis of teratoma but as a pathologist it is very important for me to tell the clinician whether it is a mature teratoma or it is a immature because the prognosis is different in both of them right. right so how do we differentiate a mature and a immature teratoma when it is a immature teratoma the immature element or the blastemal element or the fetal element is present when it is absent we say it's a mature teratoma right so uh, immature teratomas as i told you they are the most common malignant germ cell tumors but overall if they ask you which is the most common germ cell tumor then that's an uh, dermoid cyst which is uh, your mature teratomas if they ask you which is the most common ovarian tumor in pregnancy the most common ovarian tumor in pregnancy again is a dermoid cyst but most common ovarian malignant ovarian tumor in pregnancy that's a dysgerminoma and ma'am like you said that in a teratoma you will have representation of various germ layers mm. the most common germ layer derivative which is found in a teratoma we've read it as ectodermal element okay right mm. uh then students we have this slide and this is also very very characteristic can be asked as a spotter in your exams these crystalline structures which you see here these are rinkes crystals and they are seen in lydic cell tumors remember normal lydic cells also have rinkes crystal it's not that they are only found in lydic cell tumors but tumors will have a lot of these crystals okay. right so whenever we have a case of a sertoli lydic cell tumor or a lydic cell tumor these rinkes crystal might be present right so uh, based on clinical history also ma'am we can say that it's a lydic cell uh, exactly. tumor because lydic cell tumors they are androgen secreting tumors of the ovary and whenever we have an androgen secreting tumor of the ovary typically patient is going to present to you with features of virilization there will be clitoromegaly yeah. there will be deepening of voice there will be increased muscle mass and there will be hirsutism and when you are going to check the levels of androgens the level of androgens will be very very high yeah. now so much so that if they ask you know in a question if they say that there is a female who has rapid onset hirsutism and they give you this and she has a mass in the ovary and you know histopathology was done you should immediately think yeah. about the sertoli lydic cells tumor or you can also think about hyalus cell tumors but mm -hmm. hyalus cell tumors i don't think so they no. have any specific histopathological yeah. finding which these children have to exactly. know so uh, if you have an androgen secreting tumor and a histopath image given to you it has to be a lydic cell tumor, cell tumor. yes right 
Next step, my students, this is a very, very characteristic image can be asked in your exams. So can you appreciate these gland like structures which are present? And there is some pinkish material in these gland like structures, right? This is characteristically given the name of call external bodies. And where do you see these call external bodies? Granulosa cell tumors, right? So these are glandular structures. Some people say they look like a rosette, right? Rose like arrangement. And there is a central a space filled with a pinkish material right when i do a high power of this slide i see these nuclei have got these grooves right these nuclei have got these grooves and these are called as coffee bean nuclei again students pathology and food right we tend to imagine food items right so these are coffee bean nuclei and what are the dds of coffee bean nuclei in pathology you have to remember papillary carcinoma of thyroid langerhans cell histiocytosis brenner's tumor chondroblastoma and granulosa cell tumor right now these are certain ovarian tumor profiles which you need to know let us move back to this question in this question this image is given now in this image we characteristically see these glandular structures filled with pinkish material and coffee bean nuclei so these are call exner bodies and coffee bean nuclei seen in granulosa cell tumor with the history we make a diagnosis uh, with the history of a young female we make a diagnosis that this is most likely to be granulosa cell tumor now ma'am one uh, trick which i tell all the students in my class for a granulosa cell tumor is that if you see a slide where you are getting an image like it is being there are many follicles in the mm. image this is how a follicle also looks like yeah. so if you see a histopathological slide where you have you see it seems to have many follicles then it has to be a calyx in our body and it has to be a granulosa cell tumor that's a great tip <laughs> <laughs> so over here we have a 35 year old naliparous female and the uh, pathologist has to told us that it is a granulosa cell tumor now what am i going to do see like endometrial cancers ovarian cancers also you have to do a surgical staging and for surgical staging you have to do a laparotomy right and over here they have done uh you know appropriate surgical management they have asked so they have asked whether we are going to do a right salpingo oophorectomy or right salpingo oophorectomy with omentectomy multiple peritoneal biopsy pelvic para aortic lymph node dissection and they have given various combinations of these in the options what you have to understand is that once i get this diagnosis i have to do a staging laparotomy for any kind of ovarian cancer and the staging laparotomy procedure is that you are going to give a midline vertical incision any ascitic fluid which is present you are going to collect it and you are going to send it for examination if there is no ascitic fluid you have to take saline you know you have to put saline and saline washings you have to take then you have to inspect and palpate all the organs and then you have to do a total total abdominal hysterectomy plus bilateral salpingo oophorectomy but that is for epithelial cancers as far as germ cell tumors are concerned and as far as your sex cord tumor sex cord strobal tumors are concerned now because germ cell tumors are seen in young females right so you cannot do a th and a bso there and over here this is a sex cord stromal tumor which is happening in a reproductive age female but the history is saying that the patient is nally paris and she desires future fertility so in this case also i am not going to go for a th and a bso i am going to go for right sided salpingo oophorectomy right that's the surgery i'm going to do after that i'm going to collect multiple peritoneal biopsies and i am going to do an omentectomy now there's a catch over here many times in questions instead of saying omentectomy they say that we collect omental biopsy mm. we do not take omental biopsies we do an omentectomy and we have to do a pelvic and para aortic lymph node dissection so this is how you have to do the surgical staging in granulosa cell tumor also 
The other very important thing in addition to this, what you have to remember is that granulosa cell tumors are estrogen secreting tumors. And because they are estrogen secreting tumors, they can lead to endometrial hyperplasia, mm. right? And endometrial cancer. So before I decide that I'm going to do a right-sided salpingo oophorectomy, mm. I have to do a DNC and I have to rule out endometrial hyperplasias and cancers. Because if endometrial hyperplasia plasia or endometrial cancer yes, is present then I have to do a TH and a BSO rather than doing a right sided yeah. salpingo oophorectomy right so this is how you are going to proceed with the management in this patient that you have to do a DNC and after DNC once you've ruled out endometrial cancer and hyperplasia you are going to go for staging leprotomy mm -hmm. So here option A was right-sided salpingo oophorectomy, B was right-sided salpingo oophorectomy, omentectomy, multiple peritoneal biopsies and pelvic paraiotic lymph node dissection. Option C, everything was same and they had added a word and DNC, right? And option D was TH and BSO. So I'm not going for TH and BSO. I am not going for option A and B. I'm going for option C where they have this word DNC mm -hmm. added. That's very, very important. In all estrogen secreting tumors of the ovary, you have to do a DNC beforehand, right? So, uh, this brings us to an end of our session today. Uh, I don't know, ma'am, how much the students benefit, but definitely I have benefited a lot and I have seen the slides from a pathologist's eye today. Same here, ma'am. I learned so many clinical <laughs> tips, so the feeling is mutual. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And um, uh, ma'am, uh, this session has brought us, you know, has brought so many other things also. We have enjoyed the process of the session exactly. as well. <laughs> exactly. So we'll keep on doing such sessions in future. Thank you so much and all the best. And yes, please do not uh, forget to leave a comment for us, which could be positive and all the negative comments are also welcome. Uh, thank you so much. All the best. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.